welcome to the annual DEF CON convention. This meeting was held in exciting Las Vegas, Nevada from July 9th through the 11th, 1999. This is video tape number 41. No applause. Hands up who was drinking late last night. Yeah, don't applaud. Hands up who was drinking late last night. Who was drinking come sun up? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the pills are appearing on a hack of Jeopardy team. You're in a losing one. So, um, in case you're wondering why I'm wearing the, spe the sun specs, it's not really because of the fact um, I want to look cool, it's more because of the fact that, um, well, it's a bit bright in here, is the polite way of putting it. <laughs> well, and also welcome to this talk, which I have come to term the cursed talk recently, and uh, it's uh, struck again. This time with the projection system. Hands up who can see what's on the screen on the palm top on the desk in front here. Thank you. What palm top is the best answer I can come with at this point? One Toshibo libretto. Um, it's not, doesn't seem to be willing to project. It doesn't even do it under Windows, let alone Linux, which the presentation is under. So um, I'm going to probably have to deliver this without doing the projection. I suspected this might be the case. <laughs> what was that again? Ask around. Ask around. Pass it, pass it around. Would I get it back afterwards? <laughs> mm, yeah. Don't worry about it. I'll make sure there's a full copy of the heads are available. I'll give you a web address where I'll post them to in the coming weeks so you can download the copy of the overheads. So I'll do it verbally and you can download them then. Is that okay with everyone? Okay, we'll move on that. Actually, I should be able to give you a better set than what I've got here because this is an interesting story. I found out I was speaking at DEF CON after I came to the United States on vacation. That's why I've only got my palm top with me. I just brought it along for web access. And um, all I had on it was Windows 95 and Linux. And the only presentation year I had is Star Office under Linux. So that's what the presentation here is in. But the main presentation which I submitted was actually in PowerPoint and it was left back in Britain. And uh, that, I'm saying this is a cursed talk because when I wrote this up on the laptop, rewrote it up on the laptop for you all, I did it in Vegas and the heavens opened. So if it rained here, I think I might be to blame for it. And uh, in Britain, when I did the original one on PowerPoint, I did it a couple of days earlier. And uh, after that, I was in a road smash and had to be cut out of the vehicle about three weeks ago. So I'm here with cracked ribs, but still operational. So I'm viewing this as a, a minor setback, not being able to display this on the other projection. And just thanking the lucky stars, the ceiling hasn't fallen in. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Shh. It's the best way on this. So, what's the talk about? Well, literally, the talk is about simple methods which can be used to damage a company's website or damage a company's web presence or internet presence without necessarily hacking the site itself. There's all sorts of techniques, and as I've been asked to do this for the Newbie Channel, I've picked some of the simpler ones to outline later on, which can be done, and particularly strong emphasis on the defense against them. If you've not read the sheet, I'm a lecturer in computer networking and also on computer security and information security. So it's more aimed more towards protection than attack, but naturally to defend, you've got to know how the attack occurs. So I'm going to be describing that out to you. 
So it's in basic terms, and if you're expecting some radical new hacking exploit, um, you're in the wrong talk. But it's an alternative way of thinking things which many people in security tend not to look at. And hopefully I'll open a few eyes about out there to what security should be rather than what, a, what quite a few of the vendors are selling. Right. Do you mind if I look at the palm top rather than point it out to the crowd? I mean, who can actually see the actual screen display? <laughs> Hands up. So in other words, about five yards is all that. Do you mind if I look at it so I can see what the sections are? <laughs> Thanks. The problem with the libretto, if anyone ever gets one, tube libretto, is that the screen resolution is 640 by 480, which, believe it or not, a lot of projection screens will not display. In addition, the fact is very, very high frequency on production, and um, that's what things a lot of the presentation devices won't do. It is turned on in the BIOS, if anyone's asking, um, to actually project out on the overhead projector. So um, that's the reason why it's not displaying. And, and unless someone here wants to come up and reconfigure X windows, so I can't see it, but to uh, knock down the screen <laughs> display um, thing to actually get it up on the thing, they're welcome to have a go if they can do it in two minutes flat. Anyone here can do that? Won't work. The reason is because of our, the, the resolution is set I'd have to set for the screen display as well as the driver. You'd have to knock down the hertz ratio of the system if it doesn't have a standard VGA function. You have to knock down the, the speed resolution, lose the screen display, but knock it down to something which that can handle to put out on the, the screen. So that won't work, I'm afraid. Tried it. <laughs> okay, right. Um, let's get underway. Extra border hacking. Why defenses are required beyond your site's boundary? I'm the only one who can see this overhead. Why am I clicking to it? Well, first of all, is everyone here should be aware of a conventional model of connecting to an internet. For a small to medium sized company, you have a site, you're connected to the internet via one single link. Your logical model of internet connectivity. You to the internet. Internet to you. Now, I assume most people here would not connect a company via any leased line technology without putting in a firewall. I think it's a given thing that everyone here would actually connect a firewall. Anyone who wouldn't? You wouldn't connect a firewall. Why is that? Ah, okay. But okay, you'd put some kind of method of actually net at large, wouldn't you? Or more importantly, between the, your company and the attendees of DEF CON, I would imagine. It's realistic, isn't it? And so you'd actually have that in between you and the internet. There's a great deal of computer security vendors out there who are selling firewalls as the be-all and end-all of security. I hope people by listening to some of the talks at DEF CON have started to realize that if they had that conception beforehand, that's not necessarily the case. Firewalls are good. Firewalls will help you. They won't do everything. You have been attending the other talks, haven't you, I trust? Yes. Yeah. Right, okay. I'm just asking at this point here because, um, you know, in the previous times when I've been to DEF CON and I've turned up before, um, a lot of people have just gone on drinking sprees up to Sunday, then turned up because the bags have been kicked out of the hotel and therefore hang around the presentations for a little while before going back. Did anyone notice that this morning? No? No? All the luggage in the corridor? The thing is, firewalls enforce a kind of fortress model. 
the traditional orange book based approach to computer security. For those who didn't know the orange book, a security standard for actually securing sites, it's based on the fact of hardening sites against attack. You form a fortress and defend against it. The old traditional model of computer security. There's also another model, time-based. Pioneered by Bob Ayers and uh, talked about a lot by Wynne Schwartow, if you haven't been hit by one of his books thrown into the audience on the subject. If you were there last night, you probably were hit by one. But literally, both of these are based on a kind of fortress model. And it's interesting that computer security is often analogous to actually real life and old things in which happened in history. So really a firewall is nothing more different than a castle. It helps protect your site. And what people forget is that castles have problems. There's a whole series of things in history where castles have actually been detrimental to the defenders. Anyone remember, heard of a certain battle which occurred between Julius Caesar in France, famous for its what's called tactical donuts? No? Any military people here? Alicia. Alicia, that's the one, yes, I was leaning on to that one. So, um, so you're fed? <laughs> <laughs> Right, thank you. Quiet. Hmm, interesting. Right, so I've all note it down for later. You walked into that one. The key thing to note it's taught at all the military colleges. It's worth noting the fact it's very famous because from tactical donut. And the inner defenders were trying to get out to attack Julius Caesar, while outer ones were trying to get in to attack him on the outside. So it's a very unusual battle scenario. But the inner defenders just could not get their troops out of the gates in sufficient numbers and only could attack one small part. And that was in part what led to his victory. But there's a whole series of other cases where fortresses have been negative. The job of a fortress is to buy time against an attacker. It's to deter an attacker and also to make the defenders feel safe, whether they are or not. The placebo effect. I'm sure there's many computer consultants in the audience here today, and I bet many of them have sold firewalls, and perhaps, not, perhaps knowingly that the firewall isn't perhaps the best product, or in some cases that the customer didn't actually need a firewall. And um, how should I put it this way? The fact that they sold them to them because the customer felt they needed one to make them feel safer. It's a visible symbol of authority and security, and it's a demarcation line. And it does force anyone attacking to invest more effort in trying to break in. Great theory for defense, but there's a problem. Historically, and you always should look at history because we always repeat history's mistakes in the current day. Very few fortresses were ever stormed by force. Look at your military history. It's littered with cases of attacks on fortresses. In most of these, the fortress was not stormed by force, or if it was, only at the final end stage. And that end stage was the end of a siege. Most fell due to being starved into submission. The defenders would surrender. And there's various methods of forcing this to be done. In particular, cutting off key services that the defenders rely upon. It's very unlikely anyone can build a fortress which doesn't need some external services. Think about a company's internet link. Does that need any external services? To operate? I'd argue you'd have to have some, otherwise why on earth did you connect to the internet in the first place? So literally, you've got that flaw. 
and there's been a whole series of these throughout history and to move into modern history is to give a military example the fall of Singapore in World War II where the Japanese effectively cut off the water supply and therefore forced the British forces to surrender you can go throughout hundreds of cases where the fact this has happened. You cut off something essential, something people didn't think about, and it forces the other side to capitulate. And this is worrying, because many sites connected by internet links, but protected by firewalls, have key services which are important to them running on the outside of the firewall or elsewhere on the internet where they may be vulnerable. I'm sure we've all perhaps seen the situation where you have web servers outside firewalls on the internet when perhaps you won't really want to protect the actual web server more than the people running Windows 95 at the desktop. But that's where the firewall ends up going in. So, let's look at the attacks. Let's see what can go on. And the first one is your internet service provider. Everything you do goes via them. Simple really. Everyone here knows that from the access at home, if not from their companies. Who trusts their internet service provider? Hands up. Put your hand down if you are your internet service provider. Ah, right, okay. So in other words, none of you seem to trust them. Why? Hmm. Unknown quantity? They're a company out there? They see all your traffic. They know what you do on the internet. They know what sites you visit. As could anyone who breaks into their systems as well. If someone breaks into your internet service provider, they can alter stuff which normally would be viewed as being secure. An internet service provider is often, I used to use a vague word there, often, aren't the most secure systems out there. Okay, some are. Some are very, very secure indeed, but others aren't. They all tend to have vulnerabilities. They're often concerned with getting the product out. You'd hope that they'd be more technically oriented than the people, for example, at J Blogs and Co. Chris Factory. But you'd be surprised sometimes at the vulnerabilities which stuck out there. I've gone to quite a few web hosting companies and just found straight out of the box installs of Linux Red Hat 4.1 with no bug patches out there running several hundred websites off the thing. I'm sure you probably all know of similar cases, or Windows NT straight installations and no bug patches being placed on them. So in other words, they have vulnerabilities, and uh, just ask Dark Tangent about DEFCON.org and via this hosting company if you want to. Has anyone ever seen DEFCON.org website? Did anyone see it on Friday? Yeah? yeah? Who, who saw it on Friday? Most people here haven't. Didn't see it. No. They're already here, so didn't have any internet access, right. Well, in case anyone wants to know, that uh, the defcon.org site got altered, didn't it? Mm, yeah. So, I mean, it happens to them by the hosting company. Again, it was held by an external hosting company. Someone broke into the external hosting company's computers and alters things. And this is worrying, particularly if people do a variety of attacks. Now, assuming you've got your web server at your site, so we'll assume a medium-sized company, least line connectivity, website running on their site rather than an external host, and they're connected via an internet service provider. Right? Well, if you break an internet service provider, what damage can be done? Well, they can do the following. First of all, sniffing. I'm sure you all know what sniffing is, am I right? Yeah. No, not that. <laughs> <sighs> no grief, right, okay. Um, <laughs> right, okay. Uh, did you win any of the tickets to Palomino? 
obviously not. Right, okay. Right, sniffing in case anyone didn't know the computing term is monitoring and recording your traffic. Anyone on the internet search spider could do it. There's tons of programs out there to do the system. I won't go through them all, or any of them in fact. But the key thing is they can just record your traffic, see what's going past on the wire, and record it down. If you're logging on to external machines, unencrypted, which most people tend to do unfortunately, you have bell tax to get the ID and passwords. But one of the most serious things is actually just seeing what sites your company visits. And particularly for blackmail purposes for certain staff, but in addition for industrial espionage. Because your email goes out, and I'm prepared to put money on here that most people in this room do not use encrypted email when talking to commercial clients. Very few companies, when emailing other commercial clients, tend to encrypt their email. So if someone breaks in the internet service provider, they could spy on the actual tra email traffic, record it going out to the company, find out who your company's clients are or providers, how much you're perhaps charging for them, and maybe undercut you or be able to work out your financial position. It happens, particularly if you're from France, or going to France. Allegedly. Well, the key thing to note is that's one thing. The other thing is DNS analysis. The DNS system of running an internet service provider could be monitored. See which sites you visit and so on. Would be nice if your rivals were able to post up X Corp has 25% of its accesses to porn sites and pass it off to a newspaper. I'm sure that would go down well with your managing director, the CEO. But, so? oh yes, and this is what this next slide is, and you can see this. <laughs> You're sat in the front, very handy for this. Yes, it can be changed. I'm sure you've probably seen some of the other talks on the poison getting caches, but what about hitting the primary and secondary DNS servers? Most mid-sized companies tend not to bother hosting their own DNS servers on site, even if they've got a web server. They get their internet service provider to host it for them. This means that any DNS lookups requesting their domain get provided by their internet service provider to whoever asked, and then they talk via the internet service provider to the company. So if you on AOL, any AOL users here? No one wants to admit being on AOL. Hmm, strange. So obviously not many security professionals in the audience. Uh, a lot of them tend to have CompuServe and AOL accounts, I've noticed. Oh, they do. It's true. It's just they don't. Go on, let me ask the question again. Honestly, who has an AOL account or CompuServe? None. Right, okay then. I don't believe it. Some of you will. Okay, who had an AOL account and dropped it? Thank you, he's got some people answer. <laughs> Now the thing about it is that these internet service providers, they go by them, they get the DNS information off your app, the SP server hosting the website, they get that, then use the IP number to talk through to the site, TCP IP basic talk, I'm not going to go into it anymore, but what happens if someone breaks into an internet service provider, changes that DNS information, they can redirect where the website's going to, so instead of going to your company's website, they can be redirected to another one. So people going to yourcompany.com suddenly go to www. <laughs> Insert your favorite site of choice. dot <laughs> com. Yeah, you redirect all the email as well, yeah, it's particularly to the rivals or something completely inappropriate. That's right. And in addition, of course, there's another nasty attack where you hack someone else's DNS one, which is a completely different site, and redirect their email to you. 
your target and that means that they get all the spurious emails which they wouldn't normally expect could be embarrassing for certain kind of sites again to clog it up there's all sorts of tricks which can be done with this DNS redirection it's not no it's a hacking attack it's not that tricky to pull off okay that's leave DNS for time uh, I want to get through a few more services in particular denial of service attacks which you've all heard of I'm sure particularly the old-fashioned hosing attack and this actually operates hang on does anyone does anyone know what hosing is literally it's just sending people so much traffic that their pipe can't handle it my pipe's bigger than yours so I can transmit more data than you can handle so you cannot access the internet so I've got a T1 you've got a 56k modem I broadcast 64 well, I broadcast like 256 kilobits a second to you you're not going to be able to do any web browsing or anything on the internet whilst I'm transmitting that's what the hosing is and again, that's an interesting one because firewalls at sites often make hosing attacks more possible. They slow down connections. Anyone here who's worked in a company who's got a firewall connected via an ISDN line or slow speed connection, then suddenly upgraded the speed of link and tried to put use the same firewall on the higher speed link and suddenly found you've got no improvement in actual connection speed. Anyone have that situation? Yeah, a few professionals out there. Because of the fact the firewall wasn't able to handle the extra traffic, it was a limitation of traffic. And this is very worrying because a lot of systems have this and a lot of military fortresses in the past have had this. And there's a famous case, everyone heard of Horatio at the bridge from military history? From Roman history? Yeah. Well, one person essentially stood at the bridge, everyone had to cross one at a time, the attacking army was able to face the entire army one on one, and essentially save the city by defeating the army. He died himself, I believe, but um, was able to defeat the attack. So this is the sort of thing again which applies, and firewalls do constrict your access speed, so in some ways they make you more vulnerable to these sort of attacks. And we all know denial of service attacks don't need much knowledge to carry out. Any script person can actually get stuff off certain sites on the internet. Now these are the more technical external attacks. But there's been some incredibly insidious, very basic levels attacks which can be carried out by people with no technical knowledge whatsoever. And they've got me including here technical knowledge, being able to visit a certain website, get a script and to press go and type in an IP number. There are some even more basic level skills which can be done to attack this. And this is based about actual information and poisoning information out on the internet about companies. I assume there's a good number of people looking at this crowd from the age group which is here. Most of the younger people probably aren't up yet, I assume. That a good number of you work for companies. How many of your companies have a policy of monitoring what is said about your company on the internet? Hands up. That's most not, but a good number are, good. Because most companies tend not to check what's been said about them on the internet. And that is dangerous. Information is power. Poisoned information about a company can be damaging. Say the fact that you are going to post a loss in the coming quarter gets out to the people trading your stock on NASDAQ. What's going to happen? Yeah, we all know what's happened. We've seen some cases of someone, people trying to talk up stock as well recently using false information. And the problem is people accept what they are told across the internet without really checking the sources. And the problem is people can do these attacks, particularly on things like news groups. 
Now, most people here probably access news groups at one at a time, alt.sex, dot whatever, or other topics. And, well, I know you have. A, there's always one in the audience, you can always get one. The thing is, that you always have people who access these kind of sites, and particularly useful ones as well, like comp.os, Linux, and so on like that. And hopefully comp.os, well, stuff on libretto is trying to get it work, but he's over projection systems as well. I'm going to have to visit that one. The thing is, fake press releases could easily be published on a news group and the hope of causing you problems. And it can be done virtually anonymously. Forget what people say about, oh, you can always track people across cyberspace and so on. Well, any person can go and get an AOL account, or one of these trial accounts. You find them, well, who hasn't got them coming through the door? You know, just, just go and get a magazine, pick one up. Enter in some kind of financial information for the registration. Connect on via a hotel room, register on someone else's name, paid for in cash, and um, you can post anonymously. Um, any other internet service provider probably similar, a CompuServe, and you name which one you want to do. I'm just picking on AOL because I have an AOL account. <laughs> I know, I got it to where I came to America in hope of getting internet access. Yeah, there is actually, my name on the summit. Why, do you have a look? Ah, right, yeah, okay. It's not actually my name, but it's close to it. Um, so I'm not really slagging off AOL, don't worry about that. Uh, it did work, I've been able to get internet access. But the key thing to know is the fact that these companies which distribute things widely do make this vulnerable. It is possible to do it. And the people publish via things like Deja News in addition, it helps muddy the waters. They can almost certainly get away with such a posting. So it's not exactly news, not exactly difficult. The offence is, if you're going to defend yourself, you're going to have to check news groups for comments out about yourself. Use a search engine for news groups such as Deja News. Search for your company's name. See what's there. And publish quickly counter statements if any occur about your company. You're going to have to be on the ball on this. It's worth noting that many companies use such companies to search for news articles on themselves, press clipping agencies, which tend to return once a week. A number of these actually do this on the internet as well, and it might be worthwhile paying for such a company to actually search for your press clippings and information to see if anyone's doing this about yourself. And it can affect small companies as well as large ones. Imagine if you're a small burger joint and uh, someone posted news to a local news group that you had food poisoning outbreak. Gets into the local press. Problem. People could also email poisoned information pretending to come from you. There's plenty of guides on out there on how to hide your email and disguise where it's coming from. Use the trick I told you earlier and uh, just actually connect on using port 25 and enter the information. There's tons of script information out there. And they just send it there and it appears to come from you. Okay, if you had a check you'd find out it wouldn't have come from the person. Who thinks newspapers are able to take the effort to check up all the releases sent to them to check the header information to confirm everything's correct? Okay, major ones do it. What about the local newspaper? Hmm? You know, you've got to watch out for that. That can happen, particularly also to clients as well. Hey, I mean, people do it all the time, like cancelling hotel rooms of some speakers coming to DEF CON. It does actually happen. So... What happens at this point? Well, how do you defend it? Well, you should use digital signals, sign signatures on emails. Anyone do that with their email? Yeah, go on. A good number of people here do that. Digital signatures just really take the contents of the email, produce a hashing function out of it, so you can tell the email message is actually it came, who it came from, and the contents haven't been altered. You can do that on emails, you can do that on the news groups, but it's not perfect because how many people here think 
everyone who you send digital signatures to bothers checking their authenticity. How many people here have had a download off the internet of some popular application, share your application, and it's had a file or a digital signature, say generated with PGP, and you've checked the digital signature to check your binary was not altered? Who's actually done that? About 20% of this audience. Who reckons the general population at large bothers? Not likely. Most don't do it. So there's no really easy answer to actually defend some emails. Okay, that one there. Oh, good grief. Moved ahead. So let's have a look at some other little simple ones. And the most obvious one of all is the domain name registration trick. I assume everyone's registered their domain name. In fact, I think most people in this audience probably have tons of them um, or registered those investment opportunities. Some companies didn't. Left themselves open. And uh, quite recently, a couple of major companies never bothered registering their domain names and they got taken over. You probably heard of them in quite a bit in the press. I won't mention their names and won't embarrass them. But uh, I'm sure you'll find plenty of information on websites about it. But there's various things you can do. You need to register these domain names. Make sure you get them. Also make sure you make get the .net and .org as well as the .com. Don't leave yourself open, as some conferences have done on hacking in the past, um, particularly one which called Beyond Hope, which very nearly had beyondhope.com registered when they were using hope.net as their domain name system. Because the fact people have a tendency to go just typing names to try and find out sites, make sure the fact your domain name matches, and also get logical alternatives to your site to protect protect your name. This is important because make sure if you've got an O in your name, you register the letter zero, number zero, in natural your name. Microsoft, for example, with a zero instead of an O. Because people will use that and they might be able to convince people that their site is a genuine one. Ones instead of eyes. Some poor users, and for example, AOL users have discovered you can't tell the difference between O and zero and one and I on the actual software. You can also do derogatory versions of your domain name. Make sure that you get them. Just like quite a few of the t-shirts which have been wandering around at DEF CON. Make sure you actually do that if you wish to protect yourself. Yes? Is that just because the is no longer enforcing their own regulations? Correct. But there's all sorts of ways of even getting around it at that point. Say for example you have um, um, federal universal credit cards. I mean, they won't allow that domain name, but you know, you could actually do that. Um, you get your initials. Um, just the K, C at the end becomes a K. I'll leave it up to you to work that one out. Um, there's ways of doing that. You could legitimately form a quick corporation very quickly with that, and then register that. I mean, potentially have a reason to have that domain name. Um, trademarks is a major issue, and because they're not all international, they're nationals, and dot coms are international sections, so it's a real set of muddy waters on that at that area. But you're correct. If there was strong enforcement at the top level, people wouldn't be able to do this. And uh, some countries have enforced such a stringent regulation on their bodies particularly on the, in other countries. Um, the ltd.uk one in the United Kingdom is an example of that, which uh, only is available to registered limited companies under their registered limited company name. The .co.uk is open, but .lt.uk, you must be a, a registered company to get that particular name. So people can easily construct a site with a similar domain name, and they could even design it to look like your site. Well, I'm going to use AOL here. Anyone heard of AOLbullying.com, which knocked around until it was wiped out recently? 
It's a site for AOL users where people are emailing AOL users and saying, oh, we've lost your billing information. Please go to www.aolbilling.com and type in your ID, password, your credit card information, your mother's maiden name, and your national insurance number so we can actually ensure that you get a faster service. These things happen. Um, you know, I receive such emails going that doesn't exist anymore. But the key thing is this: people could create sites and maybe even convince people it's a legitimate site. It could be accurate copy for a while before it got changed. Yes. It could be accurate copy before it even got changed. And this could be combined with news group postings, and people could think the site's genuine, then you could change it. And you can do this for zilch. There's literally um, internet hosting companies out there who are willing to just take company orders and give people one month's free web hosting. They go to that particular um, company, say, hello company, one month's free web hosting please, I am target company name please. Here's the information you'll bill me in one month if I like your service. Please register this domain name. Here's the information. And all that's different is the email address to where the registration document goes to. You go and register it like that. It appears to be the site. It looks if anyone does a who is search on the internet that is a legitimate site. They publicize it, put something up which looks genuine, then you could just change it before the month's up to actually get the site actually appearing to change things. And that could have an effect on the the press could easily fall for such a thing. It's a way of hacking without actually hacking the site and you could get the publicity. So that's it there. So what do you do? Make sure all related domain names you control. If you have a domain name, use it. Don't use web space offer provider without your domain name. This is a free web space with a long address. Because if people are accessing using such a long address, if someone creates an account with, say, just one number different, it would be very difficult to tell the difference. And if you find out a site, get it deregistered. Do what AOL did, which is, well, I assume they did, because since it vanished, go and actually get the thing removed. They will do it in these cases quite quickly and quite easily. Just keep an eye on what's going on out there. So if you suddenly get new domain names appearing under your name, um, go and search them out and get them removed. So that's one thing we can do. There's other ones as well. Search engines. Oh, they're lovely. Who uses web search engines here? Okay, but who doesn't use web search engines here? Everybody uses them. You all go, you're typing keywords, looking for websites. You're looking for particular words, often defined by meta tags in the page or elements, and in order to get your, the site you're looking for. And almost certainly it's probably not the site you're looking for, except that gentleman at the back, obviously, who normally gets those kind of sites. But the key thing to note is the fact that if you go looking for your company's name, will you get your company's site or will you get your rival's? How many people here running consultancies to get people in the top 10 on search engines? Hands up. No one. You are. Right. Normally you find uh, that a lot of people are doing this now, and all doing out on web pages in order to actually get them in the top 10 of the search engines. But a rival could do the similar sort of thing to jump ahead of you in the queue. And also the fact this fake site could also jump ahead of the legitimate site. There's a good number of people who don't go around remembering domain names, they just rely upon the likes of Yahoo and other such systems to actually locate the sites for them and just type the company names in there, get the information coming back. So in other words, what I'm saying is keep an eye what's out there. Make sure you register with search engines. Make sure you're well positioned. Use that, com that gentleman's uh, company services if need be. I'm don't, we know, I have no financial association with you whatsoever. But, um, or similar people to make sure that you're well positioned in the search engines. And check regularly for what your company name pulls up on the web. There could be some embarrassing stuff. It could be your rivals. Make sure that you're well positioned. That's the key thing about this. Keep your eyes open. 
And I could go on about loads of extra things here, and uh, I could go into the more technical ones as well if it was required, but this is supposed to be the newbie thing. And the key thing I did for this talk is I wanted to wake people up into thinking about beyond the firewalls, beyond fortress models, beyond time-based models, and just think about the actual setup of your systems on the internet and regard the internet as your backyard which you also have to defend. Keep an eye on what's being said out there. Don't just pull down the blinds and ignore what's not going on in the street. Because it's what goes on out there could cause you far more damage than what goes in here. And you've got to bear in mind that this has happened quite a bit. In particular, anyone here go to Beyond Hope conference? Ah, anyone to HIP in Holland? Ah, a few of us went to HIP. In HIP, someone claimed to hack some of the HIP sites. In reality, it was, uh, wasn't really a hack. It was a site altered locally in America and just changed to look like it. So these sort of things are done and they do get publicity and people only realize well after that things weren't as hack, uh, weren't really the hack that actually happened. But after that, it's too late that the embarrassment has occurred. Okay then. Right, well, I'm willing to take questions now. I think it's a good time to take a few questions. And I have a few things to pass out to the audience if anyone's interested uh, from a British conference called DNS. Plug 14th of August, Blackpool, United Kingdom. You won't get an airfare over there now because the eclipse of the sun is three days beforehand, so um, it's probably why I'm plugging it. But I have a few candy bars from it. Um, ready to throw out. I'll throw them out in the audience, but I think I'll injure you all. So I'll be willing to kind of like throw them down the corridor in the next few minutes after questions if anyone's interested. Okay, questions? You mean about allowing DNS through? Yeah, particularly port 50 for me? Yeah, we all know about it. So no, it's an old trick straight through. Yeah, it can be done to that way. Uh, it's very much a technical attack. But yeah, um, a lot of firewalls essentially operate on a filter-based mechanism and will allow stuff through. Well, you know, certain people's ones like address translation blow that one out of the water. Yes, Jim from Blue Shirt. I want to say something quickly about going to network solutions and changing somebody else's registration. Ooh, the changing someone else's registration at network solutions. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, you can do that. People, when you get domain names, they have to be able to be transferred and changed, particularly from provider to provider, changing who's hosting the particular IP, the, the primary and secondary domain service. So network solutions accept requests to change things, and there are several methods of doing it, authentication. The most common used one is email address only. You can have PGP signatures, you can have signatures, but hardly anybody does it. And what happens is you go to the site, put a request to change information, even change ownership, and they email the email address listed in their document with a confirmation number. And the person then who gets that email must reply with that confirmation number to get the thing changed. If you can intercept that email and reply with it, you can change it. Yeah. Good example of the internet service provider is broken the internet service provider sniffing because then you can cat that going past and reply. Brilliant question. You get a candy bar. <laughs> See what I mean about these being dangerous? Catch. One. <laughs> they make good cudgels as well. They've got a shelf life of about 300 years, so I mean, uh, they have made sense of pure sugar, mint flavor, that word hackers rock all the way through, and um, the best thing to point out about them is that, well, watch your teeth when you try and eat one, that's all I'm going to say. A gentleman in the black shirt, which is not very identified, but holding his hand in the 26th and the one straight in the front.
Yes. I believe you're correct on that. I've always done my changes using the web interface and done the confirmation back. Yeah. Um, Mm, yes. Uh, whether that was wise to tell this audience, I'm not too sure about. Um, that's all I'm going to say at that point. Uh, don't. Mm, yeah, okay, won't work. You can generally assume that virtually everybody who's um, involved in computer security, most of them have actually ensured that the domain names are registered with a key. You know, it's a simple thing. You will not be able to get DEF CON reassigned. You won't be able to get DNS CON reassigned. You won't be able to get 2600 reassigned. But you would be able to get Joe Blog Butchers reassigned or whatever other company it happened to be. Any more questions? So let's print them all. You can do the same thing with routing options. Oh, yes, of course you can. <laughs> oh, yeah. Brilliant denial of service, that. Yeah, the old trick, if you want to do denial of service, you don't do it from your machine, you get other people to denial of service your target by doing that. Yeah, it's a great one. Yes, of course. Um, the old thing about most firewalls letting things through in the DNS request, through the DNS server outside and back our office being put over that port, it's an old trick. It's a very common being done on that. And uh, it's amazing the number of modern installations which just allow that to happen. It really is. It's sad, but it's true. The gentleman in the glasses on this side, please. You mean the fact that most people leave their mail servers globally accessible? So what I can do is externally, my fake email coming from your company, I actually get your email server to send it straight out? I've just said that. <laughs> yeah. Um, literally, whenever you use a tool such as like Eudora, you enter in which mail server you're going to be doing your posting from. And uh, as used by a lot of the spam emailers, <laughs> they use other people's email service to bounce the email off. You don't have to use your own. Most of them have got no defenses set up. Um, it's changing. The spam email industry has forced people to uh, check on this. But I could set up my Eudora account to essentially send the email from your mail server. It would very, it would appear more or less that it came from your site at that point. It's still not complete because I still have my sending address, so you can, you know, can pick that one up. But it would be muddy the waters a bit more. You've had your hand up, gentlemen, blue shirt. Oh, it's easy enough. That's not a problem. Just go and pull your record up on the internet. Uh, by default, it won't show it up on the Whois wherever you've done that. Just put a request in to change it so you have a key. If it turns out that you have a key and you didn't know you have a key, you're in trouble. You've got to do it by the old snail mail method <laughs> to confirm who you are. So um, yeah, that's another good one as well, actually. I shouldn't have mentioned that, should I? <laughs> Not all. You can request that out, but yeah, I know what you mean at this point. Uh, from the average company, yes, it will work. Um, the old letter is a good one as well. Oh, faxes. No one ever checks the, the number the fax came from, do they? I mean, we all know that trick. It's, uh, it's a very, the, these are all basic tricks, I'm sure you notice. And uh, I don't want to deal too much on the network solutions. If I can have a copy of a question which isn't from network solutions as uh, the final question, because I, so I need to get off for the next set of speakers. I should, where, where are the next set of speakers? Ah, right, OK. OK, gentlemen in the white shirt, final question. Oh, 
oh yes, adding routes, static routes, as I'm sorry, in English, so my pronunciation is a bit different, yeah, such, such systems, like saying, oh, I'm a major system, the way to the entire internet is down this modem line, um, which happened recently, but yeah, you can do some attacks based upon that. Um, I'm just wondering whether, I don't think with the time left, I'm going to have necessarily time to really explain that to the entire audience here, because there's some really sneaky tactics you can pull off with that. I notice you're smiling there at that point. Yeah, um, I'm just, it probably wouldn't be wise, and I don't really have the time to go into that. But let's just say the fact, if you go and look that up on the web and have enough time to look at that on TCP IP basics and the way routes at work, you can cause, um, essentially, traffic to go around in a circle and all sorts of nasty tricks to pull off and those sort of things. I did say that gentleman was... Sorry? Okay, so that was another nasty thing, but um, I said that was the last question, but I'll just take yours, and I mean this is the final question, okay? So for everyone who didn't quite hear that, I need to, I think, because very softly spoken, I may need to point out. It's essentially for, for in the variant of what was discussed earlier. Essentially, if they've got a financial trading system which is in real time, it's only got one hop between its targets. If you alter the route so it goes up to 32, they're in deep trouble. Yeah. Simple. It's, uh, and it's, all these attacks are generally basically very simple attacks. But they can cause a hell of a lot of problems, and that's the thing you need to watch out for. And I hope I haven't offended anyone for any companies. Anyone work fair well in the audience? Am I might to expect my account to vanish now? Oh, thank you, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's a very good one. I'll make sure it's off the DNSCon website, um, probably because it's more likely to remain up, I think. www.dnscon.org. And I'll put it on forward slash DEFCON in lowercase. Okay? So I'll make it. Sorry? Certainly. www.dnscon dot o r g forward slash defcon okay uh, put it up on that site unless someone wants to tell me another site directory they want it on I'll put that up remember the fact is my main slides are in England so you're going to have to wait for me to get back it's going to be about about two weeks till I get back to the United Kingdom so I'll have them up there if anyone wants to email me I'll put an email address up on the same page okay so it'll be about a week or so unless someone wants to actually see me now to get my email address um, okay, right, well I'm just going to throw a few things out in the audience if anyone's interested. Anyone want anything? Oh, good grief. Thank you for listening and I hope you've enjoyed the talk.